All right, peeps, on today's episode of The Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from Instagram. Lots of gems, lots of circle energy, lots of The Kung Fu Genius will give you the recipe for those barnacle knuckles. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? I'm doing rather fucking splendid. See rather, well, starting with an F bomb right away. <laughs> Straight in. Um, uh, it I, feels good to be here. Yeah, as finally, as, as many people know. Yeah, it's been a little difficult for us to all converge in the same room together because of, of schedules. We got international man of mystery, Mikey Dean, over here. Yeah. Uh, you know, always jet setting, always yeah. somewhere else. Oh yeah. Uh, we got you know, Mr. Family Man out in Jersey, and like. Shh. I'm I, I'm the guy who could do this. It's like you guys have I you wish guys I have outgr outgrown the podcast. Yeah, you know, but not not really. Well, I do have to say one thing though. What what All do right. you got to say? We have to tell the audience that you had a little bit of an accident. I had a spill. You had a spill, and I as fell a result, off a flatbed. And as a result, your your grill. Oh. Has altered, so maybe you can look into the camera and show show the audience the alteration. Uh, yeah, look at that. All right. So for yeah. those of you who are listening to us on audio, uh, I look like a pro one, wrestler. One of Jim, I look like Hacksaw Jim Duggan. You look like Doctor Teeth. You talk to Teeth. Uh, what in the Dre reference? has a a chipped, cracked, missing bit of Which tooth will in the hopefully front. Hopefully, be fixed by Tuesday. But it's jagged. It's like With it's jagged edge. It's yeah. jagged edge. It's like right? the '90s group. It's like the '90s group. <laughs> jagged Straight. edge. The the crazy part is, I believe that other half of my tooth is in is in your face. In my face, it's still in your face. Yeah. All right. So it's still with you because the fall was just that crazy. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was rather. At least I wish I can see the video. But at I least don't think it wasn't caught on me. video. Can you imagine? No, there was video. Oh, Jesus. I haven't seen it. That would be the worst viral video for the Kung Fu Genius podcast. Dre. They probably Wing already Chun posted Sifu. it yeah. already. <laughs> Falls flat no, on his face. I don't think they know I'm a Sifu. Okay. Yeah, yeah but I if would it gets not, out, I would not who, tell. Yeah, they'll know, right? <laughs> I would not. <laughs> so anyway. It's embarrassing. Uh, the, uh, before we get started, yes. the easiest way to support the Kung Fu Genius podcast is on Patreon. Patreon.com slash the Kung Fu Genius. For as little as right five bucks below. a month. You can uh, support the Kung Fu Genius podcast. Right. You get access to episodes early. You get my Instagram subscriber reel stuff for free. I'm and, subscribed. And higher levels of support. That. Yeah, makes sense. I All pay right. that every week. Yes, perfect. Every week, yes. <laughs> Our number one supporter. I pay with this. Yeah. He, he, he splits the $5 <laughs> up into <laughs> weekly payments. <laughs> the $5 a month. Right, right. Uh, and so uh, higher levels of support. You get yeah, different goodies, including like private episodes and chats and things like that. So anyway, Dre, fire stuff. here we are. Here we, here we are. Uh, we Back recorded a, a few again. episodes uh, yeah. because I'm going to be traveling for a couple weeks. I'm going to be Man. teaching a seminar in Hungary. And he's the jet setter. Yeah, but I do it like once a year. This guy, every no. weekend, he's somewhere else in another well, that's location. True. That's true. On his Instagram, How does he partying do and stuff. I don't know, man. We when I grow up, life. I want to be Mikey Dean. Yeah. I fly by plane. He flies by plane. <laughs> All right, Dre. So um, for today's episode, we decided to do some questions from Instagram. Insta. I the did IG. A, yeah, I did a couple of Instagram-only episodes, now, uh, solo ones. Why by the did way, you decide this? Um, I remember you did a solo one. Instagram questions is, is are these questions like well, it's saucier. No, we always are get, they. No, we just that we always do the questions from YouTube, and I have a a way more sizable audience on Instagram. Okay, okay. and so that's why it makes sense that I uh, we I always you know I'll put out a feeler in my stories mm -hmm. at the Kung Fu Genius on Instagram. And I'll be like, oh, questions for, you know, an upcoming episode or whatever. Mm. And I always go way more than I need. And they're always fresh questions. Whereas, like, with the uh, YouTube comments, sometimes, you know, we don't record for three weeks. And then it's like we have old questions in there. Okay. Or we have, like, uh, you know, we don't quite have, like, the pick because sometimes, well, to be quite honest, a lot of people on YouTube, they don't really ask questions. They just... They, say they, they just say stuff, right? And it's like, and it's like the longer the it's, comments, which I'm totally happy. We love the engagement. Right. It's usually proportionally so. The less likely there's going to be something mm. in there, right? So well, the yeah. thing is, it says comment. Yeah, they but comment. we always. But at the end of every episode, I always say, if you have questions for a future episode right. of Kung Fu Genius, go ahead and write them in the they comments. They should just below. put question. 
Yeah, I, I, and, I and wish you we could do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. switch it up. Switch All right, so option. we have some Instagram questions. What I you got we do. You? So many people are confused about basics in Wing Chun Chi Sao. Some view it as a collection of moves and masters confuse their own students by talking of principles and concepts without telling them what's what. The 15 Chi Sao Fundamentals is my attempt at explaining Wing Chun Chi Sao from a perspective of principles, but also with the basic techniques required to express those principles. It shows the framework for Hong Kong Wing Chun Chi Sao, in particular, the training of Pun Sao and Lap Da. This is necessary training before going on to the higher and more spontaneous expression of Chi Sao. Right now, if you use the code KFG Chi Sao, you can get a signed copy of my book for the price of the unsigned one. Click on the link in the description below and use the code KFG Chi Sao at checkout to get a signed copy of this full color, over 230 page manual on the vital foundational training exercise of Wing Chun. This offer is good while supplies last, so get yours today. First off, we got the liquid bender. The liquid bender. Yeah, that All must right. be a super skill. Yeah, well, his rival must be the air bender. <laughs> How long would you train on the wall bag daily to achieve your Bruce Lee knuckles? Uh -huh. LOL. LOL. Yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, that's an interesting question because it's a, it's a question almost of, um, it's almost a question of vanity, all right? Because yeah. uh, if you train on the wall bag regularly, right? Uh, and you know, with the proper Wing Chun punching technique, you know, hitting with the bottom three knuckles, over time, you're gonna start to see a change in your hands, all right? Usually, depends on the shape of you. Different people, like if you look at their hands, and one thing- Depends on do, the shape of your head. Not that much. Okay. Uh, maybe the shape of the head that you're punching, right? Got it, got uh, it. But when it comes to, you know, the outcome of regular wall bag training, it really depends on the shape of your fist, right? Because some people are like, oh, look at what my hands look like from all this wall bag training, and you also kind of have the feeling that that's kind of the shape of their hands anyway, right? So um, when you hit the wall bag over time, mm -hmm. uh, usually there's some kind of flattening out of the knuckles, in, at least when you punch in the Wing Chun way, where you hit with the bottom three knuckles, which supports the power line through the forearm. There's a tendency for those bottom three knuckles to actually start to flatten out a little bit. Right. Uh, but at the same time, there's still always gonna be a little bit of a protrusion on each of those three knuckles that you land with. And where that knuckle lands on the wall bag, you start to develop a callus, usually mm -hmm. a round callus. And it looks somewhat like, you ever see barnacles on the bottom yeah. of a boat, right? Right. So if you train really fanatically on a wall bag, you'll start to get what I call barnacle knuckles, where it looks like you have one barnacle growing on each of your three knuckles. knuckles, right? So, um, that not barnacles, bar knuckles. Bar knuckles, all right? So that kind of becomes a sign of someone who has trained their Wing Chun seriously because mm -hmm. they've, they've done it so much, there's now body modification involved, right? Your, your hands have now changed shape, right? But it's not much different if you look at a karate practitioner, like a serious karate practitioner who does makiwara training. Mm. You would see them, the top, their top two knuckles are bulbous and barnacle looking, right? Mm, and okay. with the Wing Chun people, it's the bottom three knuckles. But it's, it's a little bit like, you know, when uh, I was a teenager and you were a skateboarder, uh, when, when you skateboard, you know, you have grip tape on the top of your skateboard, uh -huh. which is like sandpaper, and it's, it's to keep you from slipping off the board, right? But when you do an ollie, you have to drag your foot sideways up the board to create this lift, right? So what ends up happening is the side of your sneaker starts to wear because it keeps rubbing against the sandpaper and you get a little hole on the side. On that particular right? area. And, uh, on that, oh. and that's like, oh, you're a serious skateboarder because yeah. you do so many ollies that uh, you have a hole in your uh, sneaker. And then if you do kick flips, the front edge of where the toes are starts to get yeah. worn out. So you could tell when we were skateboarding, it was like a huge, like as a teenager, it was a huge sign where like the whole front of your shoe is almost ripped off wow. because you, you're such a hardcore skateboarder. And then when people start to start uh, skate switch footed, so you do both ways to show that you're really good, mm -hmm. then you want to show that you have equal marks on both sides because then that means like you're a t you you can totally switch sides and and, and do it both ways. I right? got a random question. Random question. Yeah. Back in the 90s, mm -hmm. Washington Square Park was the place to be for skaters. Yeah, and so were the Brooklyn Banks by the Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, yeah. did you ever do that Washington Square no, Park? No, because I, um, when I was a skateboarder, yeah. uh, I started skateboarding in Jersey. Okay. And I was too young 
and we were too far from the city for like to go into the city. Mm. I knew a couple of my skateboard buddies, they would go to the city Your of skateboard. parents never sick. I'll no, take no, no, no. If I, if I told my mom, like, hey, mom, I want to go skateboard in New York City with yeah. my other teenage friends, she'd be like, no, no, you're not you going never even brought it up. No, 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 no. I, that you was a was non-starter. A no. a the, only, no. the, the only, the only, because I, I had friends who would like, they would sneak into the city to go. Cause the city had all the awesome skate spots. We used mm -hmm. to see them in the skateboard videos. And then, you know, like yeah. Zoo York was a big company that came out of New York. Mm -hmm. They had a whole team. And then we knew there were all these spots in the city. The big one were, were the so-called Brooklyn Bank. Banks, which were I heard on about the, the Manhattan Banks. side of the Brooklyn Bridge, exactly. right underneath. Yep, that place was crazy. I've gone there since to see it because it was like a place from my Still childhood. Still got the graffiti there. Uh, yeah, but they 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 put all those bumps there so you can't skateboard. Like they do yeah, a lot they, of that they, kind of stuff, right? So anyway, so that was like a sign that you were like a decent skateboarder. So like you look at a Wing wow. Chun guy's hands, you see the bottom three knuckles. Mm -hmm. Look at a karate guy or a boxer, you this top two knuckles. You, you look, look at, at a hardcore skateboarder, sneaker. shoes are ripped. You look at a wrestler, a grappler, they got the yeah. cauliflower ear, right? Right. So all of these mm. things are these kind of markers. So they had cauliflower foot. <laughs> yeah, cauliflower yeah. foot, right? Oh, right? So all of these things were kind of markers that you were like seriously into your craft, right? Right. Uh, and the thing with a wall bag training and that kind of creating the barnacles on the knuckles, right? Is that if you don't keep that up all the time, uh, it, 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 it'll go away. Like your skin will eventually just heal itself and go back to normal because you have this, you, you basically have all this extra, this callus that's building mm -hmm. because it's creating this uh, extra material to keep it from, you know, breaking off. Okay. But the moment you no longer have that pushback on your skin all the time, just your skin will start to soften again. Like, and okay. you can even see this when you look at Bruce Lee. When you look at the photos of Bruce Lee, of which there are numerous, <laughs> and you look at the photos throughout his entire career, uh -huh. you will see times when his bottom three knuckles are totally red, hmm. which meant he was probably training wall bag recently, like that day. You will see other photos where his knuckles look like barnacles, where like he's got the full barnacle ones, yeah. and then you will see other photos where his hands are baby soft. Okay, so the thing is that Bruce Lee's hands, when you see, when people always like to show that photo where he's kind of like this, and you see his hands are all chewed up. Right. Uh, that most of those photos were from the trip he met made to the Dominican Republic in uh, 1970 what? with June Ree, and it's pretty clear. That before, you know, he went on this like taekwondo tour with Jun Ri to they have a bunch of schools in the DR, right? And uh, Jun Ri brought Bruce Lee to kind of help him promote his schools down there, right? Mm. So he paid for Bruce Lee to go down there and kind of use Bruce Lee as a celebrity. Jun Ri Dominican? No, no, Jun Ri's Korean. That's wild. He's like the father of American taekwondo, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and he was a very good friend of of, of Bruce Lee. Jun Lee. And in in. 1970 mm -hmm. uh, that was really like a very low spot in Bruce's career because he had you know <clears throat> not acted in many many years he was just doing some gigs some choreography and stuff and he really that was kind of towards the tail end of him just like getting fed up with Hollywood but right before he went to Hong Kong so he went on this Dominican mm. tour like for I don't know, a week or something like that. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, did demonstrations and watched June Ri do belt tests and things like that. And when you look at Bruce's hands in those photos, he was like, he had the barnacle knuckles, right? But then when you look at him, like, the following year in Big Boss, he doesn't. And if you look at a photo of Bruce, like, six months before Dominican Republic, he didn't. So oh. this, is, this is then the other Damn. thing. Yeah. You, you, so You studied that. No, I see these things okay. all the time. Look, when I, I've been doing martial arts my whole life. When yeah. I see someone, when I meet someone for the first time, uh -huh. I check the ears. Are they cauliflower ears? <laughs> yes, no. I look at the hands. Have the hands, have this, has this person punched anything regularly? It's yes, no. Right? I look at the general body type, uh -huh. you know, physicality, broadness of the arms, shoulders, whatever, and go like, okay, what's this person's strength like, right? Like the Terminator. And then, and then finally, I look at their shoes and go, can they ollie, all right? <laughs> and, then, and then once I've gone through this checklist, then I know everything I need to know about this person and I can have a conversation with them, right? Amazing. So um, that might be exaggeration. So <laughs> some of our podcast listeners take me way too literally. Um, so anyway, um, it's very clear uh, and it almost seems like a Chinese thing. Mm -hmm. Could be a little bit of confirmation bias. But Sivu Langteng told me the same thing. He told me when I, was, when I first started teaching, he's like, oh, you have to hit the wall bag really regularly. So if someone comes in, 
you know, and they look at your hands, they're going to go like, oh, this dude means business. Mm. So I have a feeling that uh, in Chinese martial arts circles, at least in, for some, I'm not, I'm not saying for everyone, that that is a little bit of a kind of like, don't mess with me kind of sign, look at my hands. And so um, it's very easy when you have a canvas wall bag, mm. all right? So nowadays we use the wall bags that have like that the little leather pleather pack. on them, yeah. right? Because it's way more sanitary, is right? Leather or pleather? Uh, pleather. It was, it's not, no, it's not real leather. Real it's not real leather. leather. Get out of here, all right? The, Why we cost setting, so much? So, it didn't cost that much, <laughs> but if it was real leather, the wall bag would we'd be selling them Two, for like 150 bucks. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, authentic uh, eel Ooh. skin leather, Wait, all right? So what you're saying is our wall bags are vegan. Huh? Uh, uh, uh. They could be vegan. Yeah. Wow, there you go. There you go. See, mm-hmm. we're, we're up with the ecology here as well. Yes. 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 Accidentally vegan yes. wool bags. Uh, remind, remind me to tell a vegan story after this one in case I forget. <laughs> All right. a, ve- a vegan Wing Chun story. Okay? Excellent. I love vegan Wing yeah. Chun. Yeah, great story. And I might have told it before, but it's, it's, it's a story I worth repeating. So, um, so anyway, Siva Lang Ting would tell me like, hey, you need to make sure you hit the wall bag regularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if people come in, you know, and they look at your hands, you know, it's kind of like, kind of like a bit of a sign, like, you know, this is, you're serious, right? So he meant it what? almost like as a marketing thing. And when I look at Bruce Lee, I kind of think he kind Did, of felt the same way too. Now that's okay. not to say, look, if Bruce was a training fanatic, right? You train all the time, that's a consequence of your training. That's not your, that's not, you're not punching the wall bag to have the hands like that. You have the hands like that because, because you, you punch, punch the wall bag all the time. But sometimes you want to have the hands that look that way. And so you train a little bit extra on the canvas wall bag to let that happen, right? Siva Lang Teng told me like when you first start training on the canvas wall bag, and we don't use, can- we still have canvas wall bags, but they now have that pleather cover on there. Mm-hmm. Um, because when, you, when everyone is hitting the wall bag in class, no the, the, can- the canvas wall bags, right. you get all sorts of like, you know, broken skin and blood yeah. and all sorts of stuff in there. With these, you can at least wipe them off and keep them clean, right? But they don't, they don't have that same kind of nasty rub on your hands anymore. True, That's true. why if I tell my students, if they really want to get those nasty knuckles, you got to take our wool bag and turn it around, turn it around. and hit, <laughs> hit, hit the canvas side of it, right? Um, and Siva Langting told me that when you're new to hitting the canvas bag, you should put your fist flat on it and rub it down, put your fist on it, rub it up, sideways and the other way and do that a little bit but not to the point where the skin breaks because when the skin breaks you can't hit so you do that a little bit just to kind of make the skin more coarse and dry it out don't wash your hands before you hit the wall bag because Mm. you don't want your skin to be moist because it'll break more easily. easily then you hit the wall bag until you're right about to break skin and you stop because if you break the skin, now you can't hit the wall bag for another two, three weeks because every time you hit that scab, it opens, you can't hit again, right? So you go right shy of the skin breaking and you stop. Get it real tender. Yeah, and then, and then afterwards, it then you can you know, use ditta jiao, wash your hands and stuff like that. Mm. But then when you train on it again, let's say in a day or two, mm. you do the same thing. You kind of rub it up, down. You do a few sets of that to kind of make the skin nice and dry. You do your wall bag what? training right to the edge of your skin breaking. That means you do maybe a set of... 25 to 50 punches yeah. with power. You stop, you check your hands, okay? The skin's not broken. You keep going. So so what you do is How you- How come you never told me this before? Huh? Because we don't need that anymore because we have modern wall bags, all right? Jeez, I wanted it. <laughs> and yeah. I guarantee you, I have actually told you nah, this before. I, I guarantee never, I you, you just don't you remember. This. Oh, I know. I remember yeah. this story. I, I've, I've, to- I, I've told this. this, I this totally is know common, this This is common mm. Sifu Richter lore. That you'd be around so much and I wouldn't have, you, you wouldn't have caught this at one point. Yeah. Sounds like a bunch of horse shit. <laughs> Sounds more likely I told it, you forgot about <laughs> forgot it. Forgot about all right? it. Fish, so, 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 fish what, so what you do is you just go right to the edge of your skin breaking and you stop. Mm-hmm. So that's how you slowly build it up over time. Just almost like lifting weights and going to failure on that last rep and then you just stop, mm-hmm. okay? That's kind of, you go right before that. And then if you hit a canvas wall bag like three to four times a week, you're gonna have hands that look like that in a very short period of time. When you see someone with a little bit of that, that callus, if you're motivated, you can do that in about a month, all right? If you're smart. But if you don't keep it up, it goes away. Mm-hmm. If you look at my hands throughout 
like the course of my teaching, practicing Wing Chun career, you will also see these ebbs and flows. Right. There was one trip to Hong Kong where like my three knuckles were completely chewed up and the skin was super, super thick because before I went to Hong Kong, I was doing a lot of wall bag training and that just happened to be what my hands looked like then. And when, when I show people those photos, like, whoa, dude, look at your hands. And then it's like, yeah. And then they look at it now, my hands look normal because I'm not hitting a lot of wall bag, you know, doing a lot more gloved punching on mm -hmm. the heavy bags, right? So that's just a matter of conditioning. But if you look at Bruce Lee's hands, after a lot of those photos where he had the big gnarly knuckles, you look at a photo of him six months later, his hands look normal. So it's also very clear that like, in my opinion, that before Bruce Lee went on that Dominican trip, uh -huh. that he up to the wall bag training so that when he was there surrounded by a bunch of taekwondo dudes got it he was there with those gnarly looking hands <laughs> okay how long does it generally take to get those gnarly hands well it, it i like say like you can week, do it in about weeks? a no 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 but a solid four four to six weeks of nice. regular wall bag training okay because uh if if you go too hard in a couple of weeks you're gonna break the skin gonna break that skin yeah and then then you, it's gonna kind of bring you back so that's the see that's the secret you know the thing is that in wing chun when we hit a wall bag or when we punch something we are primarily focused on the alignment of our um of, of our arm of our skeleton when mm -hmm. we punch because uh unlike sport oriented martial arts when you if you have to defend yourself using wing chun on the street the presumption is you're not going to be wearing gloves so that's why we do a lot of bare knuckle punching on the wall bag at different angles to learn exactly how to punch and land with that correct alignment because you're not going to have wrist wraps yeah. and gloves that are going to help support your wrist you have to be able you have to have a wrist that's strong and flexible, right. 360 degrees, can hit at a number of different angles. So wall bag training is not just for learning bao ta, like the explosive power or low elbow force or uh -huh. connection with the stance or, or, any of the, or inch power, any of that kind of stuff, so much as it's also getting you used to hitting a you very know, solid target without hurting your own hand. That's amazing because when I fell off this flatbed truck, right? Yeah. I literally, the feet got taken away from me, right? Uh -huh. And who I told, tried to away? stop my fall uh -huh. with my hands. It happened so fast that my face got smashed into the cement and I'm laying there, but my hands were burning. Uh -huh. my, the palms of my hands were burning what, from hitting because I asphalt? tried to stop the fall. Right. My wrists were great. Your wrists were fine. My wrists... Yeah, you got those wing chun wrists. Yeah, yeah. felt... Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. We have very strong and flexible wrists yeah. for for the reason of being able to punch without. Uh, I wrist should wraps, have broken right? wrists. You're right. Yeah, most people would. Right. Wow. So yeah, that's part of what we do. So we're really worried about. Okay, like if I punch someone, am I going to mangle my hand and my wrist? Now, mm -hmm. the longer a fight goes, I mean, if you're going to use bare fists in a fight, uh, there there are risks involved. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of breaking your own hand. So that's why you really want to one end the fight quickly. And two, have as much experience as possible hitting with bare fists uh, so that you know the exact alignment, you know the timing of the punch. Because when you wear gloves, which add padding, then the timing of the punch changes. Because okay. the, the moment when you release the power depends on when, that surf, when your punch is going to land on the target. Mm -hmm. And if you now have an extra couple inches in front of you because of the gloves, yeah. well, it's gonna land at the target at a different time than if you are bare fisted, mm -hmm. which means that the timing is a little bit different. So when you hit the wall bag without any gloves on, you are really training the timing of the bare knuckle punch. When you put gloves on, it's usually a good idea to have a, a, like one or two warm-up rounds with the gloves on so you train that slightly different timing because now the, the, their fist is landing a little bit earlier because of the gloves. Yeah. So you have to change it up a little bit, right? So that's why it, wall bag training should really be just understood as practice. So it's not just for making your knuckles look like that. Palm strike. Mm-hmm. Training palm strikes. You can train palm definitely, strikes on the wall bag, absolutely. Definitely yeah. like played into that. Yeah, for sure. For no sure. broken wrist. Yeah. Uh, Wing Chun, Wing Chun people have strong wrists. Yes. So um, vegan Wing Chun story. Yeah. Oh, vegan Wing Chun story. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm pretty sure I told this story on uh, an early episode, maybe season one. I haven't heard it. Uh, no, I think, I, th I, I think you did. 
You've um, definitely told this story in class, by the way. Yeah, and, and uh, but I think I told it in one of the early, like when I was telling about teaching in New York and something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've definitely told you, but the, the, the great thing about telling Dre's stories is you can always recycle them because he never remembers them. I mean, I so have a, um, I have a steel trap. Yeah, <laughs> a, a steel strain. You have a steel strainer uh, for a mind. <laughs> one half of your teeth, one half a tooth says otherwise. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, my, my feet got Still taken straight. away from me. Yes. All right. In the passive voice, yeah. as if. So <laughs> Give me those feet. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's part of that story missing. So, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Sifu Leung Tang, in. Uh, I, I would assume this story happened around 2002. Um, because uh, as um, as many people, why is that even funny? <laughs> What's so I think funny? I know the story. That's right. Oh right, so okay, now right. you worked it out. So okay. he might remember it. Okay. <laughs> so um, you know, pre before Sifu Leung Ting took uh, retook the U.S. Association in, in 2002 2001, uh, Sifu Emin Stepe was the previous chief instructor, right? And, uh, you know, then Sifu Emin leaves, and then Sifu Leung Ting decides to take over the U.S. Association himself. And so it, it, you know, most of the, uh, the political divide was pretty obvious. Like the people who had trained with Siva Leung Teng early in the days before mm -hmm. Emin came, they stayed with Leung Teng. And then the people who kind of grew up with Emin as the head kind of stayed with Emin. Okay. And so uh, when I got back from Germany, I had the choice. And I'm like, well, I would rather learn from Siva Leung Teng. I'd rather learn from the source, right? But there were some growing pains when Siva Leung Teng took over the U.S. Association from some of the guys, who, you know, who, they had all trained under Emin previously, and then now they have to follow, you know, Sifu Leung Teng, so they have to, like, get used to rules that were not enforced under Emin's watch. And one of the rules was, you know, you have to wear a complete uniform, which includes the Wing Chun shoes, so that you can learn how to do the footwork correctly as a beginner, right? And, uh, you know, you can't just wear your big, goofy Nike sneakers and step all over someone's foot and stuff like that while, while trying to figure out the turning, right? Um, also, I mean, the, the, the shoes give you the opportunity to, to spar and not, I mean, if you're wearing your big old basketball shoes and you give someone a kick to the knee or whatever, it's kind of like, uh. bro, you know, you need to, con first of all, you need to control your force anyway yeah. when you do those kicks, but with the Wing Chun Some shoes, high it's, heels. it's a lot more reasonable, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, a lot of the students who had now just decided to stay with Sifu Leung Teng, they were not used to having to wear like a complete uniform, which included the Wing Chun shoes, right? Uh, and there were, uh, there was an instructor in uh, Texas who had um, <laughs> two technicians under him. I think they were second level technicians. Uh, which meant they were soon probably going to be qualified to be Sifus, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, they might have been third level, but they're like second or third level. It's not really that important for the story. And uh, they, you know, were used to wearing the technician uniform, but with like, you know, sneakers. Okay. Right? And uh, Sifu Leung Teng taught the, his first seminar in Texas after, you know, the newly formed association under his name. And sees these technicians wearing the sneakers, and he's like, no, they have to wear the Wing Chun shoes. They have to wear the uniform. It's, it's the regulation, right? Um, which is, like, understandable. I mean, I mean, you're in a karate association, you're in a kyokushin, and you decide to show up wearing a, a, a red gi top when their uniform is white, and you show up wearing oh, a red yeah. gi top that says Kempo Karate on it, right? I mean, like, you know, yeah, I get it. it it's like, it, it's, it's about respect, and it's about, you know, these are, the, these are the house rules. If you don't like uniforms, that's totally fine, but then also, then you don't go to that place, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they were like, no, we're, we're, we don't want to wear the Wing Chun shoes. And, and you have to imagine, like, saying this to Sifu Lang Tang is like, he's just like, what? <laughs> um, because they were both vegan. And the Wing Chun shoes have quote unquote leather on the tips, although it's, um, it's not cow leather, it's, it's pig leather, mm -hmm. right? and, but it's still an animal. And the bottom is suede, but it's pig suede. So it's, it's a Wing Chun shoe that is made with animal products, right? And these guys are vegans, and they cannot wear it because it's like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know it's like, uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just kind of weird, like, thinking in that way. I mean, I get that that's a, a point of view that people have, but it's like, yeah. And pay no attention to the child labor that most likely made that uniform you're wearing right now in China. But, you know, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll, talk about the, we'll talk about the pigs for now, okay? And then they're trying to tell Sifu Lang Teng what a vegan is. 
He doesn't know what a, he doesn't know what a vegan is. I mean, he understands what a vegetarian is, but in Hong, he's like an old school Hong Kong. It's like explain to him these kind of weird, yeah. kind of I, I American ideas, right. right? Okay, I know veganism is like, not an vegan? American idea, but I'm just saying, right? And so uh, he's like, he, he's just not understanding it. And they're like, you know, out of ethical reasons, they can't wear these Wing Chun shoes. And then his line of argumentation was so funny. He's like, the, the pig is dead already. <laughs> it's like what the pig is now alive not now alive because you decided to not wear these shoes right, right, right. so it was just funny like the logic was very spot on so anyway <laughs> what question you got next for me Dre hey everyone just want to let you know Wing Chun Illustrated is now offering a paperback edition through Amazon reaching a larger global market and no they're not ditching the glossy magazine edition through MagCloud you can now simply choose the version of this magazine you prefer and the one with the cheapest shipping wherever you live order your copy of Wing Chun Illustrated today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping for Prime members. Go and check that out. We got good, good is Sniper. Mm-hmm. Okay. These are Instagram handles, by the that way. That is correct. These are Instagram handles. All right. Yeah, so don't forget the at at the front. Yeah. Sheesh. That's some British snark. Yeah, totally. Don't forget the at at the front. All right, go ahead. <laughs> At Good as Sniper, have you heard of Circle Energy and Wing Chun? Is this a thing at later stages, Sifu? Alex Richter? Wow, I've heard of Spiral Energy, Explosive Energy, <laughs> uh, yeah. Sticking Force, mm -hmm. Rooted Energy, yeah. Chi Power, okay. Mindfulness, yeah. Concentration, oh, man. Intention. Ooh. I've heard of all the powers. Preach all right? on. But the problem is, look, all right, Kung Fu what people. What square energy? It's this square energy, it's yeah. rectangular energy, yeah. the octagon energy, right? It's like where you, where you got to wear short, shorts <laughs> and uh, MMA gloves. That's octagon energy. Octagon Big dick energy. energy. Uh, yeah. No, he went there. He, yeah, went, he there. went there. he went there. BDE. Of course he's right? going to go there. Yeah. So, um, but you haven't heard of circle energy. Well, look, what do you mean haven't heard? First of all, all of these things are made up by whatever Sifu wants to teach it, okay? Damn. The, and I'm not saying I wish I came up with I'm that. not saying made up in that they're making up something that doesn't exist. Okay. It's just that when when you talk about spiraling energy or you talk about circle energy or circling or whatever, these are just frameworks that an instructor is going to use to explain information. Mm -hmm. Okay, you you want the student to have an understanding about how uh, you're supposed to interact in this situation. When okay. this type of, when you feel this type of power coming at you, okay, then you need to use circle energy to deflect it, for example, right? But what the one Sifu calls circle energy, the oh, other no. Sifu might call unloading power. Okay. Okay, or the other might call spiraling energy. I or always the call other it one. dump truck energy. Yeah, but what I'm saying is people get hung up on these names. Sheesh. And first of all, it's quite possible I have circle energy in the Wing Chun that I teach. Mm -hmm. But what's also possible is that what I define as circle energy has nothing to do with what this reader's questions is actually asking because uh, that person might have heard circle energy from some other lineage okay. and their idea of circle energy might be something related to Shooting the stance. To, to the stance. To the stance. Okay. But someone else's circle energy might have something related to how you absorb force in general. And it's more conceptual and not like hands-on with the footwork, right? Okay. And the other person's circle energy might have something to do literally with yun sao, right? So the problem is mm. with these kind of questions is that it's like, well, I've heard, of course, I've heard of using circles and angles and spiraling and rotation and all of these things in different contexts and frameworks for different things. But that doesn't mean that this fits whatever this definition is because... I don't know enough about right, of that. Who, who, who is the person saying circle uh -huh. energy yeah. and in what way are they discussing it? And okay. if it has anything to do with the circle energy of a rattan ring, Ooh. well, that is bullshit. All right. <laughs> um, okay. But it, it, the idea that Wing Chun is solely linear, 
Um, I don't think any serious Wing Chun person actually believes that, right? It's a common trope about Wing Chun that Wing Chun only goes in a straight line, only mm. punches straight. We only have one, even Bruce Lee said Wing Chun only has one punch or Wing Chun lacks variety. And I will not argue that that is how Wing Chun is commonly interpreted by people outside of Wing Chun as being just simplistic, just a straight punch. Yeah. And it's Direct. unfortunately also the view of a lot of adherence to Wing Chun, that Wing Chun is just straight line, straight line, straight line, right? And they very quickly uh, like to say things like, you know, Yan Han Gong, Ngo Han Ying, all right? Which is others walk the bow, I walk the string, right? And then they think that that's a mic drop. <laughs> like, yo, all oh, their styles are so stupid. They go on a round curve and we go on a straight line. We're so much smarter. First of all, um, Lots of other martial arts also punch on straight lines. In fact, most punches are on straight lines, okay? The, the idea that Wing Chun people somehow are the first ones to go like, you know, the shortest distance yeah. between two points of straight line, like Wing Chun people think that by saying the most basic thing you learn in <laughs> second grade geometry, uh -huh. that they now somehow have come on some like revelatory second truth. Second grade geometry. All right? I, mean, I mean, it's like, uh, first of all, Wing Chun also yeah. has non-linear angles and strikes, especially once you apply footwork. Um, the idea that a complete martial arts system can consist of only using one angle for punching is ridiculous. And the idea that no other martial arts understand the virtues of a straight punch is very solipsistic and very arrogant. Solipsistic? Yes, meaning like you only, th you, you think everything about you, you, the only thing you can understand is your worldview. Wow. And as if your worldview is the center of everything, right? That's today's big word on the Kung Fu Genius podcast, by the way. Mm -hmm. Now I know how to describe Mikey Bean. <laughs> oh, I, I actually know have one a, complete word. I yes, have a quick question, though. Yeah. Like, do, does that mean that maybe Bruce Lee's Kung Fu was on white lines? Jeez. All right. So anyway, <laughs> but, you, you know, but, but you know what Wing Chun, pe you know what? Oh my God. You know what Wing Chun people don't understand? Because they'll what always say, like, others wacky. walk the bow. Yeah. Like the bow of the bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. We walk the string, mm -hmm. which means we're so much more profound. And then you always go, great. What happens if the other guy walks the string, though? <coughs> and then you see them go, uh, I, uh, because they don't think about that. Because, unfortunately, Wing Chun people, Ouch. with the virtue of center line and straight line and, and words like efficient, and, and uh, you know, simultaneous offense and defense, they think that by just saying these kind of words and phrases and tropes, that they somehow have a technological edge over anyone that they would fight over who doesn't use those words, even though they might just use a different framework to explain the same thing. But the idea that, oh, I go on a straight line while other idiots go on a curve, okay, what happens if the other guy goes on a curve with crushing force and your straight line punch doesn't have enough power to stop them. Then is the straight line really always the solution? It can't be, okay? Damn, damn, damn. All right? So uh, you have to also solve, if you're gonna say others walk the bow, we walk the string, the second half of that has to go, well then what happens when they walk the string? All right? So yet you have to then, un like, it, it's not complete to just say that. So to come back to this, I don't know what circle energy means as the framework of this person's question. I could explain multiple ways about using circles, using spiraling, using angles, not going in a straight line, using a circle to offset a straight line, using the curved line to offset straight, using straight to offset curve. But that doesn't mean that that's the framework here because what a lot of Wing Chun people don't seem to understand is the terminology used in their own school, mm -hmm. in this case, let's say circle energy, all right, is not like a universally accepted thing among all Wing Chun all schools, Wing Chun right? Schools, right? But other Wing Chun schools might also teach it, but under another name or yeah. under another framework. Okay. You understand? So, so that the problem is it's always this idea of the terms used in our school, the terms that are... Uh, bandied about in our explanations must also be used equally in all other Wing Chun schools. It's like, no, you're, you're, m you're misconstruing the framework by which you learn Wing Chun mm -hmm. as if it's the framework of, by which everyone else learns Wing Chun too. And that, 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 that doesn't exist even in the same sport. I mean, you could have two basketball coaches that use very different language in coaching yeah. their teams. All right? Um, and then, but maybe... In essence, they're teaching them the same game, 
All right, but they have different frameworks of how they model the way they set up the plays and the shots and everything like that, right? So it would be like if basketball coaches were complaining that, you know, this drill set that they use in this NBA team, they don't use that name in the other NBA team to, to explain the same concept, right? right. And, and Kung Fu people always have this thing that they think like, oh, my Sifu taught me spiral energy. Did you learn spiral energy? And the other guy might not know it as spiral energy, but might know it as something else. A surge principle, for example. They might use different words to explain the same thing. It's like, ah, see, you don't have this because that's what Kung Fu people do. Do you have this thing? Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't. Oh. Mm -hmm, right? <laughs> and, and, and really, it's, these are just stupid semantic games. All right? What else you got for me? Wow. Okay, let's get into... I was just going to say, does what that mean if say? by that rationale that the Kung Fu's in fact on blurred lines? My God, he's not letting this cocaine thing go. You know what I was thinking? I thought you were going to mention something else. To what be was fair, blurred lines isn't actually cocaine. That's something way creepier. Okay. I was just making a music reference. Yeah. Why does everything sound like a drug reference, though, when you say it? <laughs> yeah. It comes so, back full circle. Yeah, because Dre, just a moment ago, had one of his iconic wows, right? Everyone yeah, always yeah. talks about, you know, it's a drink, for, for those who are kind of new to the podcast, it's a <laughs> drinking game to uh, take a sip only when you're at home, uh -huh. boys and girls. Yeah, right? because you will die. Yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, to take a sip of a drink every time this dude goes, wow. All right. And apparently it's profound. We had an episode just you and I a few weeks ago and you said a wow. And someone said, wow, did Mikey Jean just do a uh, Mikey Dean just do a Dre. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's like Dre's like our very own um, Owen Wilson. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or Kanunu Reeves. Whoa. 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 Oh, I, know yeah. Kung I should Fu. switch it up. No. All right. Whoa. Speaking of switching it up, what's the next question? Uh, at with the circle energy around the A. The circle Nevious energy. Nevious <laughs> Omegax. That's, that's the meaning of the circle 369. energy. 369. Mm -hmm. Almost a 360. Okay. Almost a 69. Hey, yo. I trade. Just read the question. It always read the comes question. full circle with I know. this guy. Yeah. What are the key ways to stay fully consistent when it comes to exercise and training? Oh. That's easily solved. How? If, I, if I knew the answer to that, I'd sell it for a million dollars, right? <laughs> That's what everyone wants to know. It's, All right? Uh, I think, for me, it's self-motivation. Well, it's, it's... I mean, discipline it's is not, big. No, it is discipline. It's not motivation. Because motivation is... Break it in, down. Motivation is an emotional feeling. And you... you hey, there's, there's something called the... That's profound right there, too. I didn't take, say wow to that. Take it easy. <laughs> take, All right? Hey, hey. <laughs> It is an emotional feeling. Uh, yeah, and, and the problem is that uh, emotions, mm. they go in ebbs and flows. Yeah. So when you talk about motivation, you're talking about being in a very heightened state of emotion. But as we know about heightened states of emotion, they eventually come down. Damn. So if you rely on motivation, you'll be motivated for a week to go to the gym, and then that emotion wears out, and then you don't have it anymore. Ooh. What do you have left when you don't have the emotional high? You have discipline. That's all you have. That's all okay? you need. No one likes that because every, everyone nowadays with the internet, you want to hack. The three things you can do and you'll never lose motivation. And get the hell out of here. Even the most motivated dude, all right? <laughs> even I, like, I work out very regularly. But even I go through slight ebbs and flows with my workout motivation, for example. Mm. Sometimes when it's a choice between uh, getting my workout done or, uh, well, spending extra time with my kids, I'm always going to give that extra time to my kids. But sometimes when it's like uh, getting in a few extra sets on the heavy bag or finishing this chapter for my next book, right? Then I have to like think about it, right? Uh, I always feel better though when I make time to work out. So the thing is that everyone has different motivational markers. So the thing that works for me might not even speak to anyone else. Like, it, like I, I could find something intensely um, motivating in terms of discipline. Like, this is a way that I really stay disciplined. And it can make total sense and be a total workable framework for me. And it'd be totally meaningless to someone else who's wired differently. So the problem is you have to respect that everyone is wired a little bit differently and that there is no silver bullet of like, all right, if you just schedule your day like this, then you'll do it. Like, it's, it's clear that the people who work out and stay mm -hmm. disciplined with their routines have a routine. 
and that's kind of the thing right there. It has to be, in my opinion, part of your schedule. Yeah. You have to put in your workouts the same way you put in a doctor's appointment. It's non-negotiable. I got to go to the, I got to go for my checkup on Wednesday. I got to go and hit the heavy bag for 20 minutes on Thursday. Can't be late. Yeah, Friday. Yeah, you set up the time. Friday, I'm going to do some, you know, upper body workout stuff. Maybe uh, Saturday, I'm going to do some kicking and legs or something like that. You schedule it. All right. And you stay true to that appointment. That appointment for your workout, for your training, for going to class, whatever it is, is just as legit as your appointment to go to the bank or uh, your court date or whatever. Right. So you have to have it. Now, there's some people that don't like rigid schedules, you know, but they still get stuff done. It's just it's like a different type of personality type. Right. So they might have a thing where it's like, oh, I'm going to work out every day. Uh, not always super hardcore. Maybe one day I do a hard workout, the next day I do something a little bit more light, but I'll work out every day and I'll find a time to put it in the ebbs and flows of my daily routine. And there's some people that that will work for them. Whenever I go, all right, uh, I'm not going to be able to work out in the morning, but I can get my workout done later in the day. I never get my workout done later in the day because when I don't do it at the time that I really know I can do it, I don't get it done because I will then always prioritize something else. So, I feel that you have to come up with a routine okay. and the routine, you can modify it. Coming up with a routine doesn't mean like, all right, uh, I just came up with this thing I'm going to do every week. And after two weeks, you go, ah, I can't really do this. Well, just modify the routine. Just just modify it. OK, don't it, don't don't be like this binary. It's all in or all out. You do a routine for two weeks ago. Ah, Wednesday, I really don't like doing this kind of work. Okay, then don't do that workout on Wednesday, all right? Either skip Wednesday or do something else Wednesday or do Wednesday at noon instead of at eight. And then do that for a couple of weeks and then improve make it. The like just Im Im make it an evolutionary process until okay. you get the one that fits you perfectly. Don't go like, oh, well, I tried this for two weeks. It didn't work. Okay, then adjust it so it does work, all right? That, that, that's all it is. So I, I'm a huge fan of scheduling workouts and scheduling training. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also have to then figure out, well, and I'm assuming we're scheduling training time outside of, let's say, going to a regular martial arts class. The martial arts class is easy because it's on a schedule. You got to go Tuesday, Thursday at this time because that's when there's class. Okay, no problem. That's the easiest thing you could schedule. When you're talking about your own training, all right, I, I'm not a morning guy, but I way prefer doing my workout in the morning. Because you get up, you do your workout, and you're done. Yeah. And then you feel great for the rest of the day. You have energy. You feel more coordinated because you actually, you know, use your mind-body connection in the morning before you do anything. So that whole day, I don't drop stuff. If I get my workout in the morning, I never drop like a bunch of coffee on the floor coming into City Wing Chun in the morning, right? Okay. That's strange. You're like, I people would never do, do that, like that. Right? People do shit like that, right? Wow. Just because you just feel you have this extra spring in your step and this extra yeah. coordination, right? When I have to work out in the evening, and I don't mean teach or do martial arts training, but it's like, oh man, I, I want to hit this uh, upper body workout, right? And uh, I got to do it in the evening. I always feel that I'm, I push myself to get it done mm. um, because at that time, you know, like your body wants to wind down and like now I got to push and do all these sets and then, you know, hop on the rower and do all the bah. Uh. But put me on that same thing at nine in the morning and I'm bah, like going crazy. right? And that's just me. Some people might find that the evening is the optimal time for them to work out both in terms yeah. of energy and vibe. OK, so it's not a matter of imitating the exact details of how I work out so much as it is schedule your weekly flow. Okay. And the other thing I can say is make it playful because if it's not fun, you won't do it. So for example, when I go to the gym, Man. I don't particularly, so we have our own gym here at City Wing Chun and normally I like to work out in my own gym. We can play our cool tunes. Yeah. It's my school. It's my house. Yeah. But we've been doing renovations now for the past few months, so the, I can't use I can't use, use my gym. own gym because right. it's we got tons of stuff back there right now. In the next few months, 
that'll all clear out. I'll have my gym again. So in the meantime, what did I do? I can't stop working out. Mm. So I got a gym membership. Oh. So I got a gym membership for now, even though I have my own private gym with all my favorite equipment, but I can't use it right now. But most people would go like, oh, I can't use my gym right now, so I won't work out. No, 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 no. You still got to work out, buddy. You still got to work out. Otherwise, when you get off, it's just going to be so much more difficult to go back. So I go to like a New York sports club and I, pardon me, I fucking hate it. <laughs> All right. I hate uh, right, going right. like you go to the gym yeah. and it's like a bunch of dudes in there. Yeah. Half the dudes don't know how to use the machine that they're on. Right. You see some guy doing some exercise like this with the cables with way too much weight. And you're like, what? what? You know, World. every time I see some dude doing a bullshit exercise that they they don't really like they don't know how to work out. So they're me. They're doing something on the cables. It it's up. always on the cables with way too much weight, <laughs> uh, like no. doing something like. So are you yeah. are, are you trying to rip your shoulder in half? What What is the point of this exercise? Right. I always in my mind, I say, um. Yeah, bro, uh, this exercise works out my genecticozoink. <laughs> Anytime I see someone doing some bullshit workout, I go, oh, he's, he's training his genecticozoink right now, right? And so, and, and so you walk in there, and there's this, like, vibe, like, dude, you know, you do some sets, the dudes are looking at you, like, oh, what, are, what are you do? Like, that, but, you know, I put my headphones on, I don't pay any attention Try. to that, right? But I understand why going to the gym for most people is, like, bleh. You know, you, if you're a woman, you go to the gym, dudes are gawking at you the whole time. You're a dude, you go to the gym, people want to see how much weight you're lifting, what sets are you doing, or just waiting for you to go to another machine. It's a shitty experience, right? So I, I found this pocket at around 10 o'clock where it's a little empty, where the okay. early morning people are gone, but the noon people haven't come Ooh. yet. And even then, it's still kind of weird, but I have to go to the gym. Why? Because the gym keeps me healthy for practicing Wing Chun. I do so much Wing Chun in a week through my teaching and through training with my students that all the Wing Chun muscles get way overworked, all right? Uh, if you're a Wing Chun practitioner, you don't need to do any front raises. With, like, if I see Wing Chun people go and grab dumbbells and do front raises this way, he's like, why? <laughs> Have you looked at Wing Chun? Your arms are out in that position the whole time. Uh -huh. You're now taking the head of well, your shoulder, make them stronger. which is no, you're not making them stronger. You're making them overworked and you're damaging no, them. No. Because them you stronger. already get the front head of your shoulder gets so much work in Wing Chun. Chain punching, chi sao, the forms, your hands are in front of you all the time. That it makes no sense to go to a gym and then do that one even more. And you're just kind of putting more mileage on this thing that you're using all the time. But for example, you go to the gym and you do face pulls where you're now working the back of your shoulders and the mid back, mm -hmm. which helped to support this whole thing. So I go to the gym and I go, everything I do at the gym is going to plug up the planes of motion and ranges of motion that Wing Chun doesn't specialize in. Because Wing Chun is a fighting art, not just, it's not a whole body movement. So you art, don't right? work your adductors in the gym. Yeah, exactly. Like to, to go you up to the machine do and do that thing wouldn't that. make any sense, right? <laughs> but to do the opposite version would make sense, okay. right? And then so I do some things that support the Wing Chun practice. Uh, for example, uh, Nordic hamstring curls. Yeah. Very difficult exercise to do. One of the best exercises you can do for the Wing Chun advancing step. Beca Hello. Because you're training essentially your leg biceps. So the ability to to grab the ground and pull mm. yourself forward. That is it, it's a very difficult exercise, but that's the exercise that I do. So I do stuff, you know, partially to keep a balanced physique. Mm -hmm. um, and I also do some stuff to support my Wing Chun practice. And I do stuff like a lot of movement to stay in good shape. Mm -hmm. For a 45 year old, I think I move pretty well and pretty flexibly. You're a 45 year old? Yes. Um, and also the other thing is, I wanna be able to play with my kids. You don't look like a 45 you know? year old. Thank you. I want to be able to play with my kids. Like I want to be able to crouch down on the floor and grab yeah. them and lift them up. Right. And you look at most people yeah, my age, they, they, but you look at most people our age, they can't do that. So why do I go to the gym? I go to the gym so that I can play. All right. So I don't go to the Keep gym like, playful. oh, I got to do all these sets and stuff like that. Yeah, I got to go to the gym and I got to get a workout. That's the discipline part. But when I go there, it's like, oh, cool. So I'm doing pull-ups and I'm like, oh, these pull-ups are going to allow me to do a better lap sal, or they're going to allow my shoulders to stay in better condition to do chi sal for a longer time, right? So I go like, wow, and I'm just thinking about how this is going to help me. So I make it into a playful thing. And then so I do usually three strength workouts a week, two upper body, one lower body. And then I do a heavy bag work, wall bag, and my martial training. So like a lot of forearm training I get is from the pole and the knives, right? So I don't do a lot of forearm stuff at the gym because I got the pole and the knives, Okay. right? 
And I don't do a lot of explosive stuff at the gym where I do like plyometrics and stuff because I got the heavy bag and that stuff I can do here. So I found like a workout flow that mixes strength training, movement training, combat martial arts, weapon stuff, traditional stuff, and flexibility. And I just do that so at regularly scheduled intervals throughout the week. The secret to staying disciplined is to keep it fun. To keep it fun. Yeah. Okay. And because and you, you have to attach meaning to it. Um, bodybuilders go to a gym mm -hmm. with a different motivation than martial arts people. So martial arts people should be going to the gym to think that, okay, the stuff that I do at the gym is going to improve my martial arts. It's going to make me punch harder or it's going to be me, allow me to fight longer mm -hmm. or kick harder or have a uh, power in different uh, planes and ranges of motion that I wouldn't otherwise have. So you go to a gym and you go like, wow, everything I'm doing here is going to improve my martial arts. So th that's the motivation. You're not going to the gym to go to the gym because there's nothing intrinsically rewarding about going to a gym. It's a fucking awful place, smelly place, <laughs> weird fucking people, all right? Um, <laughs> but, but, but you go, what you do is you, you, you for example, um, when I do um, uh, lateral raises, Okay, I'm going like, uh, I'm training my ability to, to keep my shoulders down while they're under load. So I'm going like, yeah, this is gonna make my shoulders look nice, mm -hmm. but there's also going to just reinforce body mechanics in Wing Chun. So it's like, it's all, it's all part of that same motivation. Whereas a bodybuilder goes to the gym for the sake of developing those muscles for the sake of showing them off. Yeah. That's their motivation. The martial artist goes, what are these exercises going to do to improve my martial arts, right? A dancer goes, how, are, how is this workout going to improve my ability to dance, right? So the moment you've, you figure out what is your workout actually helping you do, don't go to the gym for the sake of going to the gym. Don't go to the gym and lift some weights uh, for the sake of next time trying to lift more weights. Mm -hmm. Because at some point you're going to plateau and then what, you're going to stop going? No, there has, it has to be tied with something you're doing and something you're improving. And then it becomes fun. And then the discipline part becomes easy. Forget motivation. We all live on a hedonic treadmill, mm -hmm. okay? Which means that- Hedonic. Hedonic, right? Like hedonism, right? Okay. Which is- um, Mikey Dean, which you know is, that word too? Hedonic? Absol uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but so for the, other reasons than this. Yeah, so the, the hedonic treadmill is like this. Um, you, like most people have a baseline in terms of how happy they are in general, all right? So like your general outlook on life you know, like how motivated you are, how positive you are, how negative you are, your general vibe pretty much stays the same, hmm. okay? Um, which uh, can be both good and bad because if you, if you have a very bad baseline, you kind of stay there, right? Other people are very kind of cheery and that's their baseline, right? I have a right? bad baseline. No, you have a very good baseline, right? <laughs> but, but what happens is throughout your life, you have these ebbs and flows where mm -hmm. you suddenly have something really great happen in your life, Ooh. okay? Uh, you know, you meet someone or That's you have, you have your first child or, uh, oh, yeah, you know, something, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, you fall into some money, whatever it is, right? You and, fall and, and, off and, a and, flatbed. And you fall truck. off a flatbed, right? <laughs> and then you, you, you have this experience of great motivation or elevated uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. And then over time, you go back down to your baseline again. All right, so that's what's known as the hedonic treadmill. Hedonic you're, 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 on, you're basically always on baseline and you, wow, you have this great high for a little bit, yeah. but you never stay there because it's not sustainable. You always come back to your baseline. But it also works the other way, where you have something very tragic, you lose someone in your life and then you're in this lull and then over time you come back up to your baseline. So that's part of the reason why using motivation uh, the emotional thing of motivation to go to the gym doesn't work because you're like almost relying on staying on that high. You need to find something that's going to make you go to the gym when you're just on the normal ass treadmill of your life. Not when you feel super motivated or even not when you're really down and like, oh man, I really got to go to a gym and change my life. Oh. Or, oh, I feel so great. I want to go to a gym. Now, you don't, you don't want to be operating in those two extremes. You want to be like, I go to the gym because it just, it allows me to do the things I want to do. I can play with my kids. I feel better at work. I sleep better. I can punch, kick, and do whatever I want better than I would otherwise. And that's a lot of fun and that's rewarding. And that motivation has to be able to be there when you're on that hedonic treadmill, not when you're suffering the ebbs and flows of life. Because then, that, because that's not going to last. Brilliant. All right. What yeah. else you got? Wait, I, I'm question. motivated by vengeance and hatred, just so we're clear. <laughs> I, I find it interesting when uh, you tell someone you're a martial artist 
in whatever context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a martial artist. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, what discipline? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a How great did word. I come around. Discipline's a great word. Yeah. All right, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. That people word it that way. Yeah, but it is a discipline. They're all disciplines. <laughs> all right? They're a way of life. Is it's, there a martial art that's not a discipline? Uh, Rex Kwando. All right, let's go. What's the next question? Machine <laughs> Yi. <laughs> okay, next up we got at. He wants, he wants applause every time. Proteo.matia. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Thank you. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. This is, this is a misspell. Tipe. I was about to say tipe, but it's type. Uh-huh. Yeah. What type of force do you use in your Wing Chun? Wow. Fajin. Falik. Yaolik. Etc. I know Chinese words, too. Oh, all no. Right? Oh, no. Yeah, well, hey, this is almost an identical question to the one about circle energy. All right? Oh. Uh, so, you know, what, what, what framework do you use to explain uh, the martial art that you teach? Now, um, there are different ways to explain it. Uh, first of all, if you're using Mandarin vocabulary, <laughs> all right, I'm automatically not going to use that one. Wing Chun is Cantonese. We don't use Mandarin terminology, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a small point, but like um, it does bother me a little bit. Um, Wing Chun, uh, the art that we practice Wing Chun is famous from Canton, mm-hmm. mostly made world famous through Hong Kong. They speak Cantonese there. And I just feel that when martial artists who practice Wing Chun use Mandarin terms mm-hmm. to explain ideas, I just find it lazy. All right. I'm not saying that's the case here. He's just listing all of them. All right. He also has some Cantonese ones there. Uh, So it's not um, it's not the person who asked the question. I'm just saying in general, um, it's like when people say Wing Chun Qigong. Qigong Qigong is Mandarin. Wing Chun is Cantonese. Like just to hear it's it's like imagine if people casually mixed Italian and Spanish. (laughs) <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're both Latin or based romance languages. And right. presumably, if you understand one, you can understand a little bit of the other. But it's kind of weird to be, uh, yeah. you know, uh, to, to mix these two, you uh, know? Some time ago, like a couple of weeks ago, I told my, uh, my girlfriend's mom, mm-hmm. who's Puerto Rican, I told her, yeah, yeah, uh, I got it. It's, it. it's done. It's finito. She was like, what the fuck does that mean? Finito. I thought it was Spanish this whole time. <laughs> Finito is not a word in Spanish. I'm not even sure if it's really a word. It I know, like but a, I've been hearing sounds it. Sounds like a on white person word. For Finito. A, think of, Finito. I've hey, been I speak hearing Spanish. it all my life. Uh-huh. I've been using it. Uh huh. Thinking it was a Spanish word. Yeah, but, but the weird thing about that Finnish. is that regardless of w- what its origin is, I yeah. mean, most people would still know what it means. Absolutely. Right? Just, it's like you finito. said finito, and I'd be like, I have no concept of the word coming out of your mouth, right? <laughs> I'd just like to say also another example is be like, you know, people that mix English and American. Uh, hey, man. <laughs> if American English is good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. All right? So... Uh, I think British English is straight pirate. Straight pirate? Yeah. Are they, they any straight pirates? pirates? Are they it's any a, straight pirates? They get I don't it know. As opposed to gay pirates. So anyway, they get it from pirates. Did, did, didn't, didn't I have a question here? Okay, so. Um, <laughs> Falik. So, so, so again, like you know, uh, the the appropriation of Mandarin terminology for Cantonese-based martial arts is something that it just. It, uh, I, I I've accepted it because it's a common thing, but it just makes my eye twitch a little bit. It's like. Uh, peeps, let's. Uh, I, I recently was asked to review a book about. Uh, uh, I can't say what it is about. Um, a, uh, a about a martial artist and a Cantonese-based martial artist, and one one of the phrases they used in the book was in Mandarin, and I'm like, you need to change this to Cantonese because this person would not have said this in Mandarin, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, because I just feel that. Uh, Mainland China and Mandarin and Mandarin speakers are trying to kind of slowly eat Cantonese away. And I'm going, to, I'm, I'm just going to say it here. I will fight until my dying breath for Cantonese not to die. I know it's going to die because that's what the mainland Chinese government is doing. But it's in, it's more than a language. Uh, it's a culture. Yeah. And, and so that's why if I ever come off a little bit, uh, uh, 
like, uh, I don't know, a little fanatic, almost like a bit of a zealot on this topic. It's okay. because I, I see that there's an erosion of Cantonese culture. And it's like, it's the Mandarinization of Cantonese. And I, I will fight it at every turn. Okay. okay? So uh, that's, just, that's just say, so Yaolik, elastic power. Fat gang, this kind of more difficult to explain, intrinsic internal energy kind of thing. Again, mm -hmm. this is actually almost the same question as the circle, circle energy, energy, because these are frameworks, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, they're frameworks used to explain how we apply certain ideas. If I'm able to move you off of your base, how do I explain that? Do I explain that using terms of physics and science, okay? Displacement, okay? Newton's laws of energy. Or do I use a more mystical sounding Chinese name to be like, well, uh, no, I, I'm not using Newtonian mechanics on you, all right? All right. I am somehow uh, um, outside of the world of science and physics. I am using Yaolek, <laughs> elastic power, all right? Look, all right? Good. All of these Good types heavens. of terms, all right? Soft power, rigid power, internal power, intrinsic energy, muscle force, alignment, mind, whatever you want to call it, ultimately has to be explained through, through physics, through a physical interaction. What am I actually doing here? How is this principle working, right? And the language of our Chinese martial arts predecessors was not the language of physics and science. It was the language of using the best approximations they had terminology wise mm -hmm. to explain what they were doing to someone else. And those frameworks are very important to understand. But I think we need to slowly start abandoning these foofy words. Okay. Man. Because, uh, if I put you up in front of a heavy bag and you start punching, all right, you can either hit that thing with power or you can't. And it doesn't matter what name you use for it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Because uh, then don't. No lick. Yeah, no lick, right? <laughs> because put, put, put someone there who's just a regularly tra trained boxer in a normal boxing gym and let them punch you in the stomach. And, and what you would feel, you would say, oh, this is a tremendous type of gang energy. No, it's, not, it's, a, it's a properly aligned punch. Okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, I, I and, and there's always sometimes with these questions, like I said, with the circle energy question. Um, I take the reader at face value here asking which one I use. Well, I mean, we, we have five different power transfer methods in WT. I talk about it in my ChumQ book, available online. That's Check right. the link below. I talk about the five different t types of power displacement there, and I use, or types of uh, power transfer, I should say. Uh, and I use normal, normal terms to explain this kind of no longer couching it in this kind of mystical Chinese, mystical sounding Chinese stuff. Because even the Chinese stuff is not actually mystical once you understand it. But the use of those terms makes something non-mystical sound mystical. You understand okay. what I'm saying? So why don't we just get rid of these terms that make these things sound fantastic? It's, it's a bit fatuous at some point. It's like, let's just explain what's actually going on. Here I am displacing you. Here I am using gravity to pull you to the floor, okay? Here I'm using rotation. Here I'm using my, my joints as, as, as if they were a whip, like a lash, all right? Like these, there are ways that we can explain this that we no longer need to couch it in these kind of mystical sounding things. So uh, it's, and, and again, then for the specific application of, you know, what someone calls fa geng or fa jin in Mandarin, right? Uh, even among experts in those, let's say, internal martial arts that use that fat, and fat gang's always that kind of whippy power you use, and you hit someone, and then the guy's bowels explode, and he falls down, right? <laughs> um, still yet to see that in a fighting contest. Yeah. Pl plenty of controlled demonstrations of that stuff, uh, but not really on the street so much. Um, the, you know, when you get a number of internal martial art guys who all believe that they can fat gang all right, you will find that there's not even consensus among those guys in terms of what that term actually means. As a matter of fact, they will often have a self-serving definition. The way they apply fatking and the way the fatking is done correctly 
also happens to be the method that they teach. No one ever says, fucking super awesome, but we don't quite have it. <laughs> All right? It's always, fucking is this super secret thing, and we're the only ones that have it. And then what they do is they create a very self-serving definition. Fucking is trained this way, it's explained this way, it's expressed this way. And anything outside of that is heretical. It's not true. Oh, you see those Bagua people over there? Uh, their Bagua is different from ours. And their explanation of Fatkeng is not correct because it's not the same as ours. And so the problem is wow. what you have in Chinese martial arts is this, these unending debates where people are defending terms that are nebulous. These terms don't have, they're not clearly defined. You don't go into the Webster's dictionary and look up Fatkeng and get that standardized definition you get a lot of, well, it's like this, and the other guy's like, well, no, actually, it's more this way, no, it's actually this way. So what ends up happening is you have no consensus, even among the people who peddle these things. So for me to sit here and go, well, like, the Wing Chun I teach, we're all about that fucking baby, <laughs> all right? Okay, well, then you can line up a whole number of Tai Chi experts, Bagua experts, Xingyi experts, whatever, who would probably disagree with how I would explain Fat Gang, right? So what's the problem? The problem is not the Fat Gang. The problem is in the defense of these stupid words, okay? Okay. Um, and I mean stupid not that people who profess these things are stupid. It's just that what is the more important thing, okay? Mm -hmm. I can hit you with power and do something or that I have this so ultra nuanced way of explaining what I do to you that I can talk about it for hours and hours and hours and hours, but you never actually see it in practice, all right? So I think these terms are, I'll define them in my books, I'll talk about them. But I think that for Chinese Kung Fu to move into the 21st century, okay. all right? Because right now Kung Fu is not in the 20th century. It's still in the 19th century, okay? All right, I want to move it to the 21st to the century. 20th All right, first. we need to maybe stop thinking that the defense of these type of words and definitions and frameworks are the important thing about Chinese kung fu. All right, I, I have a feeling like people are so lost in the defense of these terms that they're missing the whole point. All right, wow. okay, so. Uh, Got another question for me? I think we have time for one more. All right, let's do it. Right, Mikey Dean? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, Mikey Dean says yes. Mikey Dean says yes. At, yeah, I said yes. Gandolfini the Grey. Gandolfini the Grey. That's a great answer. That's actually quite awesome. Yeah. If you could go back in time and dedicate yourself to a different martial art, what would you choose, Sifu Alex Richter? Xing Yi. you genius. Oh, it's difficult. I, these questions are so difficult because why, why would I just do one? Mm. Like Wing Chun checks off a lot of the, 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 the boxes for me. Okay. Um, but I also practice some other stuff because I want to make sure that when I teach my students how to defend different types of attacks that that information is coming from a place of experience and not from a place out of my ass. All right. Uh, so when, when you were practicing Wing Chun in your early days mm -hmm. and Taibo came out, did you want to switch over? No, I did not want to switch. It's over. more of a Duke's Ryu fan. Duke's Ryu. Uh, no. So, I mean, uh, the thing is that I, I practice Wing Chun. That's the martial art I teach. That's the martial art I've been doing for most of my life. But, uh, you know, I still study boxing, kickboxing, and obviously train with Magno Gama and Jiu Jitsu. Um, but if I wasn't doing Wing Chun, I don't think I would. I don't know if like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu would tick all the boxes for me. Okay. Uh, nor would Thai boxing. So I think I would probably just be doing all the other stuff I'm doing now, but I would be just be doing way more of that. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that's all I gotta say about oh. that. Wow. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. And if you have a question for me to answer on a future episode, go ahead and write those in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is
is, I'm a kung fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Gung, and I produce masters. You surpassed us, your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. They will often have a self-serving definition. The way they apply f***ing and the way the f***ing is done correctly also happens to be the method that they teach. F***ing super awesome. <laughs> f***ing is this super secret thing and we're the only ones that have it. F***ing is trained this way, it's explained this way, it's expressed this way. Those Bagua people over there, uh, their Bagua is different from ours and their explanation of f***ing is not correct because it's not the same as ours. You don't go into the Webster's dictionary and look up f***ing and get that standardized definition. So what's the problem? The problem is not the f***ing. The Wing Chun I teach, we're all about that f***ing baby. 